Hello everyone, and welcome to our Arthritis Talks Joint Surgery 101. I'm Dr. Sean Bevan, Chief Science Officer at the Arthritis Society. It's nice to be here with you again today. And for those of you attending our Arthritis Talks for the first time, welcome. When exercise, diet, and other treatment options are no longer managing arthritis symptoms, joint surgery may become the best option for relief. In fact, arthritis is the leading cause of joint replacement surgeries in Canada. We know a significant number of Canadians are exploring joint surgery as an option for treating their arthritis or are already on the wait list for surgery. Our speakers today are experts in the field of arthritis and will answer many of the most common questions we get about surgery. Before we get started, just a few logistics. This webcast is best viewed on a laptop or desktop computer. If you have any technical difficulties, please email arthritistalks at arthritis.ca for assistance. If you have any questions for our presenters, you can submit them through the Q&A. In most cases, you'll need to click on the Q&A button in the bottom middle of the screen to do so. We will try to get through as many questions as we possibly can during this hour that we have together. You can click on the chat icon on the bottom middle of the screen to access the chat and connect with other participants and the Arthritis Society's chat moderator. If you'd like to close the chat completely, go ahead, just click the red X icon to close out of the window. We're pleased to continue to provide open captioning of our webinars to accommodate the diverse needs of our audience. And you'll see that running along the bottom of the page. Many questions we received followed similar themes. So we will address those first before getting into the live Q&A at the end of the session. Before we get started, I wanna take just a moment to thank our event partners, Pfizer, United Way Winnipeg, Novartis, and our other sponsors for their financial support of our Arthritis Talk series. Now, let's get started. First, a warm welcome to Dr. Eric Bohm, an orthopedic surgeon from Manitoba, and to Susan Johnston, a registered nurse from British Columbia. First, to Dr. Bohm. We have had a number of questions from people who are thinking about surgery, but really just aren't quite sure if that's the right route for them. So to start us off, how does someone determine whether surgery is really the best option for them? Great, thanks very much, Sean, for the introduction and the opportunity to speak uh, today about um, surgery for arthritis. So I thought perhaps I'd just start off by uh, um, reminding people or explaining to folks uh, exactly what arthritis is. So it's technically, it's an inflammation of one or more joints. And the most common type of arthritis is something called osteoarthritis or OA. That's maybe a term many people have heard and OA occurs when the cartilage covering the ends of the bones uh, wears, wears away where they meet. So this commonly happens in the hip joint, in the knee joint, shoulder, and the foot and ankle. So it can happen in many different joints of the body. So often I'll see patients uh, who have arthritis on the x-ray and you can see sort of the four classic findings. And these are the common questions I like to torture medical students with. You know, what are the findings of osteoarthritis on x-ray where you get cysts forming in the bone? You have joint space narrowing. So that's where the cartilage is worn away and the bones are now closer together because there's no cartilage left between them. You don't actually see the cartilage on the x-ray. You see the space where the cartilage is. You have osteophytes forming, which is little bone spurs. And then something called subchondral sclerosis or hardening of the bone beneath where the worn out cartilage used to be. So you can see this is an x-ray demonstrating classic findings of osteoarthritis. There's joint space loss. And I can have two patients with identical x-rays and one patient is very active and has very minimal pain. And the other patient has a lot of pain and is quite disabled from it. So I think it sort of speaks to really the decision-making process focusing on the patient and their symptoms as opposed to just the x-ray. So this brings us, you know, what do you do about your painful hip or painful knee or painful foot and ankle? Uh, there are many different uh, treatment options that you can look at. I always advise people to start uh, with non-operative treatments. I don't like the word conservative, I like the word non-operative treatment. There's many, many different things that can, that can be tried. Uh, and there's lots of good evidence supporting these different treatment options. So I think first and foremost, education, understanding what arthritis is, um, how it develops and how to manage it. Uh, there's quite a strong correlation between being overweight and the development of arthritis. 
So I encourage my patients to uh, uh, to maintain a healthy body weight and certainly uh, very much appreciate the, the challenges of losing weight and often a reasonable goal is to maintain uh, your current body weight. Uh, exercise and physical therapy can be very, very helpful. There's good evidence to support that. A common question I have from patients or a worry that I have from patients is whether or not they'll damage their joint by being active, and you won't. You can be active, you may make it stiff and sore, but you're not damaging your joint by being active. Walking aids can also be helpful. These include things like braces, canes, or a walker. And I often uh, explain to, to patients with hip arthritis to use a cane in the opposite hand. So if you have a painful left hip, to use your cane in the right hand. And you may find that to be quite helpful in relieving the pain. If those things don't do the trick, the next line of interventions are medications. And there's really sort of two broad uh, classifications of medications we, we talk about or mention um, you know, for managing pain. And one is acetaminophen, which is plain Tylenol. It's quite a safe medication. There's very few contraindications. It can usually safely be taken with other medications. And the second line uh, of medication, second type of medications are something called NSAIDs. You may have heard of those, or this is a term for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And that includes things like Advil, which is ibuprofen, or Aleve, or Celebrex. These medications can help with the pain, but they have several side effects one needs to watch for. Uh, they can irritate the stomach. They can cause blood pressure problems. So if you have high blood pressure, your primary care provider needs to be keeping a close eye on your blood pressure if you take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Aleve or Celebrex or Advil. And they can also cause kidney problems. So if you do take anti-inflammatories on a long-term basis, your primary care provider should be keeping an eye on your kidney function. Other options are uh, topical anti-inflammatory creams, like a bowl trim cream that you apply uh, to the knee, to the outside of the knee. And the final line are injections, uh, things like cortisone, which uh, is a, a type of steroid. It's an anti-inflammatory, helps decrease inflammation and pain in the joint, as well as some synthetic joint fluid injections. So these are really the, the mainstays of non-operative management of, of hip and knee and foot and ankle arthritis. Uh, and I always recommend people attempt and exhaust these treatments before considering surgery. I do want to make uh, um, just a specific mention of exercise and physical therapy. And I, I think we really need to focus on that. There's very good evidence to show that uh, activity and physical therapy can improve your overall uh, function and pain level. And there are some programs like the GLAD program that has excellent uh, evidence behind it. And this is now available across Canada. So uh, this is something that I encourage my patients to try before considering surgery. So I'm going to move on to the surgical management. So my my daytime job is doing hip and knee replacements. So I'm going to talk primarily about hip and knee replacements. Most of what I mentioned here will also apply broadly to uh, to foot and ankle arthritis, to shoulder, elbow arthritis, wrist arthritis, and so forth. Uh, so this uh, picture here is that of a, a knee replacement or a total knee replacement. That's, we use the term TKR, so total knee replacement, or TKA, total knee arthroplasty, means the same thing. And there's several components to it on the right hand side you'll see there there's a, a metal uh, component that goes on the end of the thigh bone or the femur there's a plastic insert that goes between the metal parts it's made of ultra high weight um, polyethylene and then there's a metal base plate that goes on top of the shin bone um, and then there's a little plastic button you can see that goes on the back of the kneecap or back of the patella. So those are the, the main components of a regular routine knee replacement. There's many different companies that make hip and knee replacements. They're all generally the same design um, and provide the same amount of pain relief and function. There's also something called a unicompartmental knee replacement. So if you look at the x-ray on the left, you'll notice that the arthritis involves primarily the inside portion or what we call the medial portion of the knee. And this is the, the type of arthritis that often gives people uh, bow-legged alignment. So it's possible just to replace that worn out part of the knee with a partial knee replacement. Uh, the benefits of that is a smaller incision, a much, much quicker recovery and a better early function than a knee replacement. But the drawback is longevity. They don't tend to last as long as a complete knee replacement. It's a smaller device and they can wear out. And we'll get back to this issue of, of hip and knee replacements or any joint replacement wearing out down the road because it is a comport, an important consideration. And this is a picture of a, a typical hip replacement. There's uh, sort of four components to that. There's the, the metal cup. You can see in the picture on the left, the top left is the metal cup. The coating and the, 
your, the patient bone goes into the back of that cup uh, to make it stable. We then put a plastic liner inside that cup and a metal stem to the thigh bone and then a metal ball on top of that stem. So that's the ball and socket joint. And this is a very sort of typical uh, hip replacement implant. There's different types of ways to secure it to the bone. Um, one way is with bone cement and the other way is without bone cement, it's called a press fit. Um, there's pros and cons to each and your surgeon will uh, select the implant and fixation based upon several uh, factors such as the quality of the bone, the shape of your bone, uh, longevity required and so forth. One thing I did want to mention was um, arthroscopy. So in the past, uh, we used to very commonly do scopes or arthroscopy for knee osteoarthritis, and that was to trim out the worn cartilage and so forth. And there's been several large, um, well-run studies showing really no benefit to arthroscopy compared to non-operative treatments that I mentioned earlier. So really the role of arthroscopy to treat wear and tear arthritis um, has, has really uh, decreased immensely. There's still an important role for arthroscopy in younger patients to do ligament reconstruction and to repair certain types of meniscal uh, injuries. But in patients with wear and tear osteoarthritis, there's a very, very minimal role for arthroscopy. This brings us back to the decision-making process. I've talked about non-operative treatments. I've talked about the surgical management of hip and knee arthritis. Uh, so how do you make that decision? How do you decide if you should continue with non-operative or, or switch over to operative treatments? Well, really it's a matter of, of balancing and weighing the benefits of surgery. And the benefits are uh, improved function and pain relief. You weigh those benefits in one hand. And in the other hand, uh, the risk and effort to have your joint replaced. Uh, there's a lot of effort required to get yourself ready for surgery, uh, to get your family, to get your house ready, uh, and to recover afterwards. This, these are big operations. They're painful. They take a lot of work to get your strength and range of motion back. So it's a big commitment on my patient's part to do this. Uh, there's always the risk of needing to have the hip or knee replacement or ankle replacement redone. These are mechanical devices that will eventually wear out. If you're 50 years of age and have a knee replacement, I can almost guarantee you it will need to be redone in 15, 20, or 30 years down the road. Uh, if you're 80 years of age, much less likely you need to have it redone. Uh, and the last consideration, of course, is the risk of surgery. These are big operations and they carry multiple risks and you need to be prepared to accept those risks and, and what might happen should some of those complications occur. And I'll talk about those shortly. So the benefits of surgery, one of the things I talk about with my patients, I think is very easy to understand is the satisfaction rate. So in, in Manitoba, we have a provincial program and joint replacement registry. We actually keep track of the outcomes of all patients in the province receiving hip and knee replacements. And at one year, they get a questionnaire from our registry asking them how satisfied they are with the results of their new hip or their new knee replacement. Um, and we know that nearly 95% of our patients are happy with the results of their, knee, of their hip replacement at one year. And about 85% of patients are happy with the results of their knee replacement at one year. So when I'm having this discussion with patients, I can tell them if you're considering having a hip and you follow this decision-making process I've just described to you, you've got a 95% chance of being happy with the results of your new hip in one year, or 85% chance of being happy with the results of your new knee at a year. And people are happy because their pain is better and their function is better. And I think one of the things that I often answer is um, relates to expectations of surgery. Um, and you know, what are the expectations that patients have uh, of surgery? So the top five things that we've uh, discovered, um, we did a study about three years ago um, involving over 500 patients. And we asked these patients, uh, what are your top five uh, expectations of surgery? And what do you hope to gain by having your surgery done? So the top five were pain relief, improved mobility, uh, walking ability, physical activities, and daily activities. Um, so we actually had everybody list out all their expectations. And we found a total of about 24 expectations for surgery. I've, I've listed them all here. I'm not going to read them all off, but you can see that uh, particularly for hip replacement patients, uh, their expectations of surgery were largely met. There were a few differences. So things like physical activities, you can see that hip 
replacement patients who were a bit more successful than knee replacement patients in um, uh, improving the physical activity. And um, you can also see that in terms of weight loss. So many patients come with a hope or expectation or wish that they're having their hip replacement or knee replacement will allow them to lose weight. Uh, it's a laudable goal. Unfortunately, you can see that only about half of our neoplasm patients are successful in losing weight, and about two thirds of our hyperplasm patients are successful at losing weight. So um, there's some modest benefits there. And the other thing I'll point out there is, is kneeling and squatting. About a third of neoplasm patients ad, um, admit to being able to, to, uh, to kneel or squat after surgery. So I tell my patients, you know, don't have your knee replaced in order to be able to kneel because it's unlikely I'm going to improve that ability for you. So what are the efforts required for my patients for a successful outcome? Um, Susan's going to cover this, um, the preoperative aspect of it. So postoperative, I've mentioned this already, the importance of exercise and uh, partaking in the rehab program afterwards. It is painful, it's a big operation. So work with your care providers uh, for appropriate pain control medications. It takes time. I tell my patients it's a good, it's a good six months to get over your hip replacement surgery um, and knee can take 12 months and it takes a good two to three years to get the final result from surgery. So what are the risks of surgery? So we've, we've talked about the effort required for surgery. Um, and the other consideration, of course, is the risks. So there's things like infection. So when bacteria get into the joint, and they often, if this occurs from the bacteria that already exist and live on the skin, uh, there's about a one to two percent chance of infection uh, in, your, in your new hip or knee replacement, and that can require further operations and long-term antibiotics to clear that up. It's possible to damage arteries or nerves at the back of the hip or back of the knee or around the ankle or around the shoulder. And this can leave a person with numbness or weakness uh, in that limb. Uh, and it can be permanent, again, quite uncommon. It's possible to develop uh, stiffness in the joint after surgery, particularly with knee replacements. They require a lot of work to get moving. And if your knee replacement becomes stiff, you may require a manipulation, which is a trip back to the operating room to push on the knee to get it moving. With hip replacements, um, one of the possible complications is, is dislocation, so that, that new ball popping out of that cup and the hip can dislocate. So we sometimes have to tension the tissues around the hip to make sure it's stable. Sometimes that involves lengthening the leg a little bit. Uh, so it is possible to end up with a bit of a longer leg after hip replacement surgery. And to solve that uh, can sometimes require just putting a shoe insert in your opposite shoe. It's possible to form blood clots in the calf muscles after the operation. These blood clots can break off and travel to a patient's lungs and cause problems with their breathing. So we give patients blood thinner medications afterwards. In the past, we used to use heparin injections. We've now switched to oral medications, uh, medications like rivaroxaban or even aspirin in lower, uh, lower risk patients. There's always a risk of blood transfusion after surgery. It's about three to 5% after elective hip or knee replacement. And that's because the bone continues, continues to bleed after the surgery. I've talked a bit about the longevity of the implants, that these are mechanical devices that can eventually wear out uh, and they need to be revised. And the results of the redo operation are not as good as results of the first time operation. But then again, people are typically 20 or 30 years older and their functional requirements are a bit different. And then there's always a the risk of medical complications following surgery. So this can include things like a heart attack or a stroke. Rarely it is possible to die from these sorts of things. This is some data from the Canadian Joint Replacement Registry. It's a bit of a busy slide, but what I wanted to do is to illustrate uh, the survivalship of, of knee replacements. Um, we received a couple of questions about whether or not uh, I should have a partial knee replacement or a complete knee replacement. And part of the discussion I have with patients is the difference in longevity of these implants. So if you look at the graph on the left-hand side there on the x-axis or along the bottom is the number of years since the operation was performed. And on the, the y-axis or the vertical axis on the left, that's the, the, the percentage of implants that have been revised or redone because they become infected or they've gotten loose or they've worn out. So you can see uh, that bottom 
bottom line, that green solid bottom line there uh, is a total new replacement with, uh, with, the, with the resurfacing of the patella, so that, that plastic button that goes back on the patella. So you can see at, at the seven year mark, about 2% have been revised. So two out of uh, two out of 100. So that's very, very low. Um, if you look at the, the red dotted line, that's about halfway up the graph, then that's the revision risk curve for a partial knee replacement, that uni compartmental knee replacement I described earlier. So you can see the, the revision risk is about 6% at seven years. So it's three times higher. So if you have a partial knee replacement compared to a complete knee replacement, you've got about a three times increased uh, chance of needing to have that redone by seven years. Now the risk is still very low, it's 6% compared to 2%, but that still is three times higher. So these are some of the decision, this is some of the information that goes into the decision-making process with patients. So again, coming back to how do I decide? Well, one, benefit, one weighs the benefits against the effort, uh, the risk of surgery, and the, and the need for revision. So thank you very much, Dr. Bowman. That, that's a lot for everybody to consider uh, and a very thorough answer. So along those same lines, as you know, we did receive a number of questions from registrants related to surgery and, and what specific types of surgery. So could you address some of those and elaborate on some of those questions, please? Certainly, Sean, happy to. So I, I've just listed here some of the specific questions that we received and I've, I've put together a few slides answering them. So one of, uh, and again, these, these, what I'm talking about applies generally to surgery for arthritis. So, you know, the common places that we're replacing joints are in the shoulder, uh, in the elbow, in the hip, in the knee, and in the ankle. So those are the sort of common joints we replace for, for, for wear and tear arthritis, osteoarthritis, or rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, so a common question is, is the timing of surgery? When should I have my operation? Should I do it now before it gets too bad? Should I do it now when I'm healthy? Uh, are there limits to when I have surgery? Do, do not operate on people who are 80 years of age or 85 years of age? And this is a bit of a tricky uh, question to answer because it really does boil down to an individual patient's acceptance of disability and acceptance of risk uh, and the effort required for recovery. So what I generally tell patients uh, is to have your joint replaced when it's bad enough to make you want to commit to having a big operation. And the effort that's required for getting ready, the effort that's required for recovery, and the potential risks of surgery. Don't do it now because you think you might be uh, too old or too sick in a couple of years time because it may turn out that you never actually need to have the operation at all. And if you have it now preemptively and have a bad complication, I can tell you, you may well be worse off than you are now. So have it when it's bad enough to make you want to have a big operation. You had questions about recovery after surgery. I've, I've talked about this a little bit. These are big operations and they're painful. Everybody's experience of pain is different. I am surprised. I, I cannot predict who is going to have what kind of pain experience, but it's different. Uh, we have a wide variety of medications that we use and often we combine them and they're more effective when they're combined. So I've talked about some of these already. So acetaminophen, which is Tylenol anti-inflammatory medications uh, such as uh, Celebrex, and then opioid medications like hydromorphone. So our joint replacement patients go home on a combination of all three of these on regularly prescribed Tylenol, Celebrex, and hydromorphone as needed. Again, these are big operations, they're painful. It takes a good 12 months to get over knee replacement, a good six months to get over hip replacement, and it's two to three years for the final result. Uh, people often ask when can they return to work? Well, it kind of depends upon what your work is, how much sick time you have, how motivated you are to get back to work. If you're self-employed, you're not working, you're not making any money, you're very motivated and people often go back two or three weeks to desk jobs. But it really depends upon what kind of job you have uh, and physical requirements. It's sort of in the six to uh, six weeks to, to six months time frame, or four months time frame. We also had some questions about surgical approaches to the hip. I often have this question. There's three common surgical approaches to the hip. Uh, the posterior approach, the lateral approach, which is the one that I use, and the anterior approach to the hip. Uh, when you look at the data one year after surgery, the final results of these approaches to the hip are all the same. So it doesn't matter what you have. Each of these approaches has uh, drawbacks. The posterior approach to the hip has a higher dislocation rate of that ball popping out of the cup. 
the lateral approach to the hip where you have to peel some of the muscles off the, off the femur or the thigh bone. Sometimes those muscles don't heal back on and some patients are left with a bit of a limp after the operation. With the anterior approach to the hip, it's a more difficult approach. Uh, it's harder to see the structures. Um, so there's a higher rate of, of cracking or breaking of the thigh bone. And there's also a higher infection rate because it's closer to the groin. So there's really no one perfect approach, surgical approach to the hip. And my advice to people is to choose a surgeon that you're comfortable with and let him or her use a surgical approach that they're comfortable with. We have lots of questions around foot and ankle arthritis. And again, the decision-making process is quite similar to that of hip and knee replacement surgery. Um, there are several operations that are done or can be done for uh, arthritis around the foot and ankle. And the common ones are removal of bone spurs or the osteophytes that I described early on in the talk. And these can improve the range of motion, particularly in the big toe. So hallux rigidus is the medical term for it, but a very stiff big toe can be the result of some osteophytes or extra bone forming in the main joint of the toe. And those can actually be removed and that can improve the uh, range of motion of that toe. There are many small joints in the foot and ankle. Uh, most of them cannot be replaced. In fact, we don't have good devices to do that, so we'll often fuse them. So uh, place a screw or plate across the joint to hold it still, and the bone actually grows together across the joint and it fuses the joint. And because the joint is no longer moving, it's no longer painful. It's also possible to realign uh, joints in the foot. So this is commonly done for bunion surgery. And then the most common and most effective uh, joint replacement surgery in the foot and ankle is that of, of ankle replacement. And that's uh, being more and more commonly done. Yes, yeah, matter of other questions, should I have my hip or, or my knee replaced first? So if I see a patient with uh, bad hip arthritis and knee arthritis on the same side, I strongly recommend that we do their hip replacement first. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, it makes the, um, the recovery after their knee replacement much easier because after knee replacement, you have to be able to bend your hip so that you can bend your knee. Uh, that's one reason. And the second reason is often people have referred pain from the hip to their knee. And if I give them a new hip, I take away a, a big chunk of their knee pain and they actually decide to delay or, or not go on to have their knee replaced. And this speaks to the next question of having a hip replacement for knee pain. So I probably see about a dozen patients a year in my practice who've been referred to me for knee arthritis or knee pain. And when I examine their hip and x-ray their hip, they have very significant hip arthritis. And it's not uncommon to have referred pain from the hip down to the knee. So they give them a, I give them a new hip uh, and it actually takes away their, their knee pain. So this is not an uncommon situation. We had questions about anti-embolic stockings postoperatively. So these are very tight fitting stockings that go up to the knee. And those uh, were thought to help prevent blood clots forming in the calf muscles and going to the lungs. So these are rarely used anymore. Um, we've really decreased length of stay for hip and replacement patients. People are up walking the day of surgery uh, and really doing that helps reduce the chance of blood clots. So these uh, stockings are rarely used. We had questions about um, things that can be done to slow the progression of arthritis. Uh, we don't have a lot of good things to do that, but what I tell patients is to maintain a healthy body weight and to be active. Those are the two best things that you can do to help prevent arthritis from interfering with your life. Commonly get questions about minimally invasive surgery. Um, this really boils down to making smaller incisions. You're still doing the same thing inside the patient, cutting out bone, putting in implants and so forth. Uh, and it really is marketing in the US. Um, 15 years ago, there was a big push for uh, the, the minimally invasive two incision total hip. Uh, and that turned out to be a bad idea, a much higher uh, complication rate, a much higher revision rate, no movement in function. Uh, there's a, a big push right now in the US for anterior approach to the hip with thought of the decreasing length of stay. And again, the data now shows there's no difference uh, in function at one year, there's probably a higher early complication rate with the anterior approach to the hip. We had questions about balancing advice from your surgeon versus what you read on the internet. Your surgeon has uh, gone to school for many, many, many years. Uh, I can tell you that from personal experience. They've met thousands of patients like yourself in the situation, and they've assisted thousands of people to make the right decision for them. Uh, they've done this operation thousands of times. They're experts in the area. So I really think that it's important that you uh, find a surgeon that you're comfortable with 
um, and certainly supplement what they're telling you with information from other sources, from your friends and family and colleagues and so forth. But really find a surgeon that you're comfortable with uh, and they're there to help you make the appropriate decision for yourself and, and put, put some stock into what they're saying, listen to what they're saying. We had some questions about implant sizes. How do you determine what size implant for me? Uh, we do a couple things. One is we can check on the x-rays preoperatively to make sure we have the correct implant sizes. And then intraoperatively, we actually measure the size uh, of the of the bone. And we have on the shelf in the OR a wide variety of sizes so we can have the one that fits properly. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Bohm. Um, Susan, I'd like to bring you into the conversation now. Um, could you give your perspectives around how would you encourage people to prepare for joint surgery? Um, thank you for including me in the talk. Um, and how you should prepare for surgery is um, to reiterate a lot of what uh, the doctor has already said. So um, the most important thing is actually a good pain management so you can be active. Uh, as reiterated about uh, activity, keeping you moving, uh, dealing with weight loss all or maintaining weight is about controlling the pain. And it, uh, a lot of folks deal with pain like they would acute pain. So if you break a bone or post-surgical pain is acute pain, uh, trauma, these kind of things, the key to this kind of pain is it resolves with treatment fairly quickly. Uh, I get a headache, I take a towel, the pain goes away. I break my femur, I get a cast, I take the cast off, the pain goes away. But as you have all realized with osteoarthritis, this is not the case. So what often happens for folks is that they have pain and they get into what is called a physical vicious cycle. So they avoid activity because that's what you do with acute pain. When you have acute pain, you rest it, uh, maybe ice it, do all those kind of things. And sometimes that is appropriate for uh, arthritic pain, particularly if the joint's quite swollen. But if it's just this ongoing uh, dull throbbing pain that has no swelling per se, uh, as the doctor has said, you, you've got to stay active. But what we commonly do is we avoid activity, we become deconditioned, our muscles become weak, uh, the joint isn't getting fed. The way our um, joints get fed is actually through movement. Uh, cartilage has no blood supply to it. So in order to regenerate it, in order for it to heal, all of that kind of stuff, you need a blood supply to it. So what feeds it is actually movement uh, in a sac called the synovial sac with fluid in it, and that fluid is nutritive to the cartilage. So if you're not moving the joint, you're not feeding the joint. And uh, then, oh, it's the pain's worse, even though I've exercise, I'm resting, or if I exercise, it gets worse. I'm going to get be less active. And now you're uh, active avoidance, and now you become further deconditioned. And the truth is you actually get more pain because the, the muscles are becoming weaker. They're not uh, creating a scaffolding for that uh, joint anymore. And so the joint is moving around and that's how we develop osteocytes or those bone spurs. So you wanna go the opposite way on that circle. You wanna, uh, um, you wanna be conditioning minor activity starting off really slow. I'll give you examples, just getting things moving. And that may mean taking medications so you can move. So you're not activity avoidant. You have less pain with smaller activities. You keep building on that conditioning activity. And the result is a little less pain and a lot more nutrients going into the joint and building muscle psychologically what happens to us is we have pain and what pain initiates is our fight flight freeze response so think about what is the first thing you do when you stub your toe and i know you don't say ow what you do is you swear and that's your fight response and then you might freeze <gasps> do the freeze thing all the muscles get tight and you may notice that you're stepping away from the evil chair you just bumped your toe on because it's gonna chase you. That's your flight response. So when you have pain, it initiates this response. So every time you're walking along on that sore joint, it initiates this response of anger, anger, anger. And you probably are feeling that anger 
And as you feel this over months of time, as chronic pain is, it lasts for months and months and months, then you start feeling anxious about stepping off the curb. You might feel fearful and distressed about the pain. And this impacts our mood and our mood becomes, uh, you know, not so anxious, more depressed. This never goes away. It's upsetting. And this can lead to something like depression. And depression is a very serious clinical condition. And people with depression tend to have increased perceptions of pain. And people with increased perceptions of pain tend to get depressed. So we manage the pain, typically with medication. This improves the mood. Oh, sunlight, buttercups, all that. I can move without pain and not feeling this anger and anxiety. And believe it or not, it, it results in less pain. Because the more we practice pain and we don't mediate it. So in acute pain, sometimes you have to tough out acute pain. You break your leg, it might take an hour or so before you actually get medical care. You might get something for that pain. Uh, so you kind of got to tough it out. But with a chronic pain, that is a wrong approach. And the reason is, is because we, well, the more we practice a chronic pain, the more we practice pain, the more we practice stress, the better we get at it. This our nervous system becomes used to it. We get better at what we practice. You practice a language, a piano, a, you know, we get better at it. And this is because our neural pathways are laid down, so we do it more effectively. And we're doing the same when we don't manage pain properly. Oops, went too fast. Using new technology here. So if you're in that pain, how do you manage it? Because you think you should manage it like acute pain. But with this kind of chronic pain, you need a kind of a holistic, uh, a multimodal approach. As uh, Dr. Brom uh, uh, illustrated when he talked about non-operative approaches to pain. So one of the things you can start with is using what's called a pain diary. Now there's all kinds of apps for pain diary. Uh, there's all kinds of modalities of pain diary and you can even do it on a whiteboard or whatnot. And what this is, is actually giving the pain a number throughout the days to see if it changes and shifts. Take keeping track of medication, keeping track of using, you know, did you use a mobility aid when you went for the walk? And did you notice your pain improved or wasn't as bad? Or did you go for your walk without your mobility aid? And then you're like, oh yeah, my pain's much worse. So it helps you to see, tra uh, track and uh, notice what triggers the pain. Because as you probably noticed, your osteoarthritis may, may be quite unpredictable. So ideally what you're doing is medicating an hour before a trigger activity. So maybe you like to go for a, a walk, uh, but you know every time you go off on that walk, you're in terrible pain afterwards and it lasts much longer than a couple of hours. It like keeps you up at night or something like that. Best approach is taking that medication an hour before your walk. So you don't get into that kind of pain situation. Now, as the doctor has also said, taking Tylenol is the best approach. What I would add to that is Tylenol arthritis formula or pain formula specifically. So it is, it is the brand Tylenol and it's called arthritis pain. And why that is it's patented and it does last for eight hours. Your other brands like Kirkland brand extended release or whatnot do not last that long. I understand they're cheaper, but you're worth it. So using pain, uh, Tylenol uh, uh, arthritis pain is really where you should start. And ideally, you're taking it before your pain approaches. I've met people, particularly with knee pain, that take the medication when the pain is quite elevated. And they go, it doesn't work. No, it's not going to work. It will work much better if you take it before the pain occurs. And do keep track of 24-hour doses under Health Canada uh, website. 4,000 milligrams is your maximum dose of Tylenol per day, per day. So that equals two Tylenol arthritis formulas three times a day. So two is your max at one time, and you can take that three times. That is your maximum. And look at other things that you may be taking. Does that have acetaminophen in it?
Then ideally you use NSAIDs for breakthrough. So your Advil, your uh, uh, Moltrin, your Aleve. These are, as the doctor said, have many more side effects. And one of the uh, side effects that wasn't mentioned is it's a blood thinner as well. So if you're already on blood thinners, you know, it can be contraindicated. But using NSAIDs once in a while is pretty safe, even with the possibility of side effects. Most people tolerate them quite well once in a while. And always take it with food because it does can upset the stomach. Uh, and, you know, good thing to take before bed so you can sleep better. Um, ideally, also try a topical form like Vol Voltaren uh, before you would try an oral NSAID. And the good news is you can take Tylenol and an NSAID at the exact same time. They're totally different drugs. Tylenol is not an NSAID. Um, and the other thing I really want to stress is the use of ice. So we use ice for anti to, to, for inflammation. You know, it's inflamed. Uh, but the other thing that ice does for us is it fools the nervous system in feeling cold instead of pain. So this is how Tiger Bomb works, for example. It has no medicinal value in it. However, if you put it on a, a sore uh, muscle, you put that in, rub it in. Some people feel cold and some people feel heat, but it, it, that's what it's doing. It's, it's fooling your nervous system to feel something other than pain. So ice can be your friend. Remember to protect your skin because ice can burn. You put it on for 15, 20 minutes, then take it off, let the joint warm up a bit, move it a little bit, and then you can repeat that on and off every hour, but do let it warm up in between. And then heat is ideal for stiffness, if the joint's quite stiff. We know we warm up for exercises, right? Same for the joint, warm it up before you use it. Just like sliding your foot back and forth on the floor or whatnot, or applying heat to get it moving if it's quite stiff. Do be aware that if the joint is swollen at all, you should not apply heat to it, that could make it worse. And just a, a note, if you're using narcotics or uh, cannabis high in THC, no driving, please. <laughs> we would appreciate that. So really think about using all the tools in your toolbox. If you're only using one thing to manage pain, that's a problem. And so the idea of getting you prepared for surgery is really managing pain so you can get active, build muscle, get things moving. The other thing is, is calming that nervous system down. Remember, it's overreactive because of the pain. So you want to calm it down, chill it out. And this also helps with stress and sleep and any anxiety you may have prior to surgery. So things like meditation and breathing exercises are highly, highly recommended to manage all of these. Lots of uh, um, research to prove that that is helpful. And other things are like distraction. You know, do you notice your pain as much when you're distracted? I, I have chronic pain myself. I don't notice it that much. So using things like exercise, uh, music, socialization, and we will get to socialize more. It's coming, folks. And things like hobbies, uh, um, passions that you may have. Get involved and then, you know, dig out those things that you used to do, uh, particularly if they don't involve a lot of strenuous exercise. And speaking of exercise, you know, how to get moving. This helps with the arthritis, not depletes it or causes more injury. And one of the key things for all movement, exercise, going for a walk, even standing around at a party while you're drinking a cocktail is pacing your activities. I always equate uh, arthritis like if you're stuck on a wooden bench, you're sitting on a hard wooden bench, your butt muscles will start to get sore. If you're sitting on a cushion bench, sit there forever, but you don't have a cushion bench anymore. So what do we do? We stand up, move around a little bit, and then we can sit back down on that wooden bench. If you're standing on an arthritic knee or hip or whatever, you're kind of sit, you're kind of pressed down on that wooden bench. So getting off of the joint is just going to give you some relief. So if instead of going for a one hour walk, you're going to go for a walk and uh, where's the seats I can sit on and break up this one hour walk or go for 
uh, three 15 minute walks instead. So really breaking and pacing up activities. Also mobility aids. What's the main reason why you're not using your cane? I know, because you think it makes you look old and stigmatized and things like that. But your cane is a weapon, so that's always good. So you're not weak and old with that. But I also really want to stress, you're not fooling anybody if you're really limping. And if you're limping, you have to unlearn the limp after the surgery. You don't automatically stop limping. So you really don't want to limp. And other thing is mobility aids can offload the affected joint by 30%. This can dramatically help with pain management and it gets you moving and supportive. And medication, as I already said, use a pain diary to figure out what's going to really work for you. So, but it act, you know, activity irritates the joint. Well, as I said, pre-medication is going to help breaking up the activity start off small don't go big right away if you're trying to start up activity go small um and uh and there's you know very basic exercises that you can do i do highly recommend being assessed by a physio if you're kind of thinking what should i do for this joint even if you you have to pay out of pocket, saving your shackles for one visit to get a physio to assess you and give you exercises is really recommended. And then the type of exercise that will really minimize the pressure through the joint, walking is great, but if you wanna walk or hike, I highly recommend using walking aids and also braces because braces stabilize the joint, but they also, the ones that are a little bit more metal, a little, little more uh, Terminator looking, they offload the joint as well. So it can reduce pain. Marching in place, dancing at home. These are the kind of things I do, particularly during COVID and anything in water. If you're up to water, up to your neck, you're offloading your joints by 90%. So you're more or less weightless. So anything in water is going to be beneficial, beneficial and it should not initiate so, as much pain. The other one is a great investment is an exercise bike. So no matter what the weather is outside, uh, you can get on that bike and move because the exercise bike allows you to really move through the hip and move through the joint and your ankle too. So uh, other things to consider is uh, strengthening your arms and your core muscles because you're gonna need those to push yourself up and down in chairs, uh, help transfer because you're only gonna have one leg to use. Uh, do little push-ups on your chair, tightening your tummy muscles. All of these muscles are, are beneficiary, beneficiary. Uh, the other one is walking poles. Using walking poles allows you a more of a full body workout and it'll work out your arms and your uh, flanks and your abdomen a bit. Repetition, keeping repetition, repetition until you're fatigued and then do it again later. Leg exercise is basic, uh, lie on a bed, roll up a, a towel, uh, put it uh, under your knee, and then literally just lift your heel off the surface. This is working out your uh, uh, quads in front of your legs. This is gonna benefit the knee and the hip. And wall slides where you sit uh, um, as if you're in an imaginary chair against a wall and just slide down and up, down and up until you're fatigued. You're working out the muscles on the front of your legs. So other things to do is prepare for your home for all of this. And you may need this now and forevermore. It's all helpful. So ensuring you have uh, railings installed on stairs because you need those to haul yourself up the stairs and help you down the stairs because they help you offload. Uh, grab bars beside the toilet, in the shower, if you're using your toilet roll dispenser to haul yourself off the toilet, that's not what it's for. So get grab bars in. They are uh, bolted into the studs, the walls, and uh, much, much safer. Remove clutter. You're going to be using walking aids. You may need to be working using a walking aid now. Get things out of the way so you have uh, it's much safer. Get rid of any kind of tripping hazards. One of my pet peeves is little small area rugs. They are real tripping hazards. Unless they're super stuck to the floor, get rid of them. 
Um, now, uh, the, uh, the doctor talked about different approaches to the hip surgery. So the, uh, the um, posterior approach, which is what uh, the doctors that I work with favor, uh, have a lot of hip restrictions to them. And those restrictions, so that it, there's no dislocation, is no bending past 90 degrees. So if your surgeon does that approach, then you would need to uh, ensure that everything you sit on is two inches above your knee. So that means buying a high density foam cushion to put into a chair that you sit on, bed blocks so the beds are higher, raised toilet seat, and some kind of shower chair. So if you sit on a chair like this, this is my uh, 90 degree angle, and that's fine. That looks good. But as soon as I go to get out of the chair, I put my nose over my toes and I'm bending past 90 degrees. But if I sit on something that's a bit uh, high and I go to get out, I don't bend, bend past 90 degrees. Uh, get uh, frequently used items up to waist height and uh, dressing equipment is also recommended because you can't reach your feet. Uh, oh, here's the dressing equipment. So equipment. So a set of crutches is usually required. This helps you get up and down stairs. Two-wheeled walker is often what all, all at hospitals will allow you to have. They're lightweight, they fold up flat, and they, they don't require brakes to break. Uh, then the dressing equipment is your long-handled reacher and a long-handled shoehorn. This allows you to put your pants on the ground and pull them up over your feet without bending over. Uh, and uh, elastic shoelaces are recommended because you can't reach your feet to tie and untie your shoelaces. Uh, this allows you to uh, wear whatever shoes you want. And sock aids are, uh, allow you to get socks on and off without having to bend over to get to your feet. Now, a cryotherapy unit would be a little bit of an investment. Uh, they range in price from about 140 to as high as 400. Uh, that's what this uh, square unit is here. Fill it up with ice that circulates ice cold water through that pad that's wrapped around the knee. If you cannot afford that, ice packs with a tensor bandage will do the same thing. So we've talked about weight management and the reason why is for every extra pound we carry, is actually four extra pounds of stress going through your sore hip and six extra pounds going through your sore knee. So if I'm carrying a 10 pound purse, that's an extra 60 pounds of pressure going through my knee. That's why you wanna deal with weight. So uh, as the doctor said, you know, maintaining your weight is, uh, you know, like just go there, then that's that's great because it is a challenge. But if you want to really try to lose weight, don't lose too much at once. Three pounds a week is a healthy pace. Uh, places where we have calories that sneak in are fluids. Really try to make the main fluids you're drinking water. Everything else has calories in it, particularly that fancy coffee you got from Starbucks and that glass of juice. Much better to eat an apple and a glass of water than a glass of apple juice. And kind of consider looking at what causes you to eat. Stress eating is a real thing. So managing the stress may in fact help with the compulsive eating. And then looking at the divided plates. So this image is from Health Canada. And this has been a real help to me personally on looking at how I'm eating. So half your plate should be fruits and vegetables. Half of it, folks. The other is a palm size of protein, whether vegetarian or not, and a palm size of carbo carbs, ideally uh, whole, whole, whole grains. Now, when's the last time that's all the pasta you had, <laughs> right? Doesn't mean you can't, what I like about the portion plate is it doesn't mean you can't eat what you like to eat, like spaghetti or something like that. It's really how much you're eating and the portions. That's great, Susan. So I, I'm just conscious that we are running short of time, but before we get to some questions, do you quickly have any secrets that you want to share with people to ensure or to try to ensure a successful surgery recovery? Secrets. I think it's not secrets. It's pretty obvious. <laughs> do what your physiotherapist tells you to do. Number one rule, 
do what your physiotherapist tells you to do. And as the doctor is also stressed, this can be painful. This can be a painful recovery. You'll first be on narcotics and Tylenol. Use those as tools to do your physio right? If you're struggling with your physio or you're having trouble sleeping, you need to take something for pain so you can do your physio. Follow through because if you don't, you can really compromise your recovery. And just an added little thing, be aware of constipation. And somebody asked a question about this, is that it is a given with surgery and narcotics. So the more you move, the more the guts move, lots of fluids, eight glasses a day is your minimum. Uh, high fiber diet, as I just mentioned, fruit, vegetables, whole grains, they're good old scrub brush, and really use stool softeners and laxatives to kind of get you through the hard times. No pun intended. And activity milestones. Uh, doctors kind of covered this, but I'll reiterate this is three week by three weeks, you should be able to walk uh, well with a walking aid and be able to go up and down stairs. And that includes the day after your surgery, you'll be practicing stairs. By six weeks, you should be able to walk a few blocks or, you know, several blocks with a cane and ride a stationary bike. By 12 weeks or, you know, three months, you'll be able to walk long, but longer without a limp. And you will really notice improved strength and balance. And then a, a study that uh, I've looked at was knee bend. Uh, as the doctors said, you really full recovery from the knee is like a, a year ish, but it can be even longer, but full range in that knee is possible, but it will take a long time and a lot of work. Thank you so much, Susan. So I think we're going to jump right into the Q&A, if that's okay with both of you. And the first few questions here really are directed to Dr. Bohm. So Dr. Bohm, for people who have rheumatoid arthritis and are also getting a replacement, a uh, couple of different angles of questioning here. One, does the rheumatoid arthritis in any way impact recovery from surgery? And or the surgeries, are they any different when you're dealing with a patient who also has rheumatoid arthritis? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Hopefully my audio is working better. I think we had some problems with the microphone. It's working better now. That's good. My apologies. Uh, that's an excellent question. So there's, there's sort of two considerations that we have uh, operating on patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the first consideration is that often they have multiple joint involvements, so they can have sore shoulders, elbows, wrists, hands, feet. So it does make the recovery after surgery a bit more difficult, uh, a bit more of an effort. So we might need different walking aids and pain medications, modalities and so forth to help them. And the other consideration is the risk of infection. So people who have rheumatoid arthritis are often on immune modifying drugs that sort of tone down the immune system to help prevent progression of the rheumatoid arthritis. And that also can raise the risk of infection. Uh, so people who have rheumatoid arthritis are at increased risk of infection uh, following surgery. However, the good news is, is that these new medications that we have are very effective at preventing progression of rheumatoid arthritis. And I now operate on very, very few patients with rheumatoid arthritis because the medications we have now have so greatly changed uh, the disease progression. Thank you very much, Dr. Bohm. Um, you, I know that mostly you, you work with hip and knees, but you did mention in your in your talk some shoulder surgeries, ankle, toes, other joints. So a number of people ask, have asked questions about, you know, how successful are those kinds of surgeries? And maybe that's too hard to answer as a group, you know, compared to, for example, what you're seeing with hip and knees on a regular basis. Yeah, that's a good question. It's hard for me to uh, to answer it precisely, but the results, you know, the, the main joints that we replace are shoulder, elbow, hip, knee, and ankle. And the results of those surgeries are, are all comparable. So, you know, satisfaction rates in the 85 to 95% range and, you know, similar sorts of complications like I talked about earlier and similar issues with longevity of how long they last before they wear out. Okay. And then a number of questions here from people who are living perhaps with osteoarthritis, but also with other health conditions. So it goes back to your kind of balance slide, I think, slides. So, you know, what advice would you give to people who are trying to balance diabetes, um, high blood pressure, cancer, other things that are having a significant impact on their health? And when they also have a decision to make about whether or not to have a joint surgery? Yeah, that's, those are good questions. So, 
um, this is a big operation with multiple medical risks. So I really uh, encourage patients and partner with patients to um, to maximize the effective management of these of these conditions, their high blood pressure, their diabetes. Again, even diabetes can raise the risk of infection. So it's important to have good blood sugar control. Uh, there are patients that can present with serious other mel- uh, medical issues. You know, it's not uncommon for my patients in this age group to be treated or recently diagnosed with breast cancer. So, you know, what do I do? Do I have my hip replaced or do I have my breast cancer surgery? And I typically recommend that people have management of other sort of, you know, life-threatening conditions before they proceed with their hip or knee replacement surgery. Okay. And Susan, I think I'll, I'll give you the last question. You gave a lot of good advice of things that people should consider doing in these kinds of situations. Is there anything that people should not be doing in terms of, in particular, physical activity, either pre-op or post-op? Uh, well, uh, pre-op, I would uh, discourage using stairs as a form of exercise. Uh, it really is not the best choice. It can actually really exacerbate the arthritis in the lower body. So that should be definitely avoided. You have permission. You don't have to take the stairs. And I would reiterate what I said earlier. Don't let your pain get out of control. Really manage it. I know a lot of people are hesitant to take medi- medication. I don't like taking pills. I've heard it a million times. Now is the time to do that, to manage this so you can get to your surgery uh, um, as healthy as possible. There's a, a research that says that the better your pain is managed prior to surgery, the better all your outcomes are, including better pain management, faster, more successful recovery, and less infection. So manage the pain. Great. So thank you both so much, Dr. Bohm, Susan, for sharing all of your thoughts and expertise with us today. The video and presentation slides will be emailed to all registered participants tomorrow, and the recording of the webinar will be posted to our website very shortly. The Arthritis Society is going to be releasing an expert report next week with recommendations on what governments can and should be doing to deliver a permanent fix to the issue of wait times for joint replacement surgery. So please do watch our website and social media for that information. And by adding your voice to our call, you will help governments make this a priority. In the meantime, we'd like to take just a few more moments to get your feedback on today's presentation. Most of you should see poll questions come up on your screen with appropriate answer options. So please click on the response that reflects your thoughts. We will be sending out an evaluation form as well when we send out the recording. So if you weren't able to access the poll question or you'd like to give us more feedback, we'd welcome it and you'll have that opportunity then. We use this survey feedback to shape our Arthritis Talks webinar, so we really do value your input. Once again, thank you to Pfizer, United Way Winnipeg, Novartis, and our other sponsors for their financial support of our Arthritis Talks series. Initiatives such as this webinar are supported by corporate sponsors and individual donors including those who provide critical ongoing funding through our Wings of Hope monthly giving campaign. If you have the capacity to do so, we encourage you to join this community of loyal monthly supporters and help us reach new heights in the fight against arthritis. Visit arthritis.ca slash give monthly to learn more. We'll be back this fall with a number of Arthritis Talks webinars launching in September during Arthritis Awareness Month. So please stay tuned and look in your inbox for more information on those sessions. This concludes Arthritis Talks, Joint Surgery 101. On behalf of all of us, thank you for joining us today, and we hope you have a great summer.